so I will be very short. Uh, thank you very much, Marlene, and everyone who uh, contributed to this event. You know, I'm very thankful for your invitation. And um, I've been living in Japan for the last 20 years, and we run uh, the uh, you know, Central Asia program in the University of Tsukuba, which is very close to Tokyo. And every year we recruit young students, not only from Uzbekistan, but from Central Asia in general. And our purpose is to actually make uh, you know, younger scholars visible in terms of discourse, academic discourse. Because um, it is very unfortunate that in recent years we see that um, you know, we don't actually have too many scholars from Central Asia writing on various issues in Central Asia. So in that sense, I'm more involved in academic research and um, you know, I'm, I try not to take sides. And we normally um, you know, try to explain what we see as opposed to tell uh, the people what we think is right. Because to be frank, we don't know what is right. We just um, you know, analyze what we see. Now, uh, talking about the um, you know, foreign policy, you know, I realize that the panel is very diverse, so I'm not going to make it um, um, you know, too complicated. My talk is going to be um, you know, consisting of four major uh, parts, but very short ones. Uh, the overall goal of my presentation is to, I seek to answer two basic questions. And what are the motivations of Uzbekistan in, enga in engaging China, uh, you know, Russia, and Japan in its foreign policy? And secondly, is it possible to entertain a hypothetical assumption that Uzbekistan's uh, strategy in achieving its goals with these powers is partly related to exercising something that we call soft power? But normally we used to uh, apply this notion to great powers. Um, uh, in my research, I'm, I'm trying to look into whether Uzbekistan actually is in, in its foreign policy is trying to seduce greater powers by using soft power but in a different manner. And again, I have to say that you know, none of the conclusions and assumptions that I'm going to be talking about are final, and you know, I'm very much uh, looking forward for any suggestions and discussions. Now, before I go into the essence of my um, sort of presentation, you know, I have um, to uh, emphasize um, the, the fact that you know, I'm focusing on Asian powers, and I'm not looking into Uzbekistan's relationships with the United States or Europe. The reason for that is that you know, in the recent years, in the literature, we actually have seen that um, uh, the um, relationships between Uzbekistan and the US or European Union have been actually paid a very heavy uh, sort of uh, coverage. On the other hand, uh, you know, we actually don't see much in terms of coverage um, of uh, Uzbekistan's relations with uh, Japan, South Korea. We've seen some coverage in respect to China, but only confined to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And we don't see much in terms of analysis uh, in, about uh, relationships between Uzbekistan and Russia. And so these are the countries that I'm looking into. And the reason why I'm uh, looking into particular, these particular countries is that uh, we have to admit that you know, the center of economic growth, the growth of population, actually shifted from the west towards the east. And uh, it is very unfortunate that in recent years, actually, uh, countries of Central Asia, including Uzbekistan, do not actually see that particular trend. And they keep um, uh, connecting their future to the uh, you know, potential relationships with Europe and the United States. Although we actually see that economic growth and you know, financial resources are mainly coming from the East. So, and that is the, you know, the aspect that I think is uh, being neglected, and I think we should pay uh, more attention to that. Now, um, talking about, well, the next point that I'm going to cover is um, what are the motivations of Uzbekistan uh, in engaging China, Russia, and Japan? And I'm going to be very general. If you have some particular questions about some particular country, please um, you know, ask me later. And, you know, I would be more, more than happy to answer. But in my research, I argue that um, you know, China, Russia, and Japan's involvement in Central Asia have, been, uh, have actually had paradoxical and contradictory impacts, uh, which have elements of, uh, on the one hand, decolonizing, but on the other hand, neocolonizing. So they have both, uh, both impacts. While Russia, um, uh, Russian initiative or Eurasian initiative have some elements of appeal to Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan actually displays duality in the attitude towards this initiative, expressing interest in economic aspects while rejecting elements which go beyond the economy. In, the sense of, uh, in this sense, China-led Shanghai Cooperation Organization has actually much more uh, appeal to Uzbekistan uh, because it is uh, mainly associated with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization's you know, anti-colonial and anti-imperial uh, initiatives and in nature. Uh, by offering an alternative to the existing infrastructure networks, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and China as one of its driving forces offer the diversification of economic relationships. 
and thus new opportunities um, for the smaller Central Asian uh, states, including Uzbekistan, uh, 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 that used to be actually um, confined with the old Soviet structure, um, with the, all of its infrastructure you know, related to Russia, is being challenged. While this type of anti-colonial and anti-imperial identity is contributing to Central Asian development uh, by its nature, it is a negative identity building because the uh, process negates uh, influences of the United States, Europe, Russia, and does not actually offer much in terms of positive identity uh, you know, construction. Another point that you know, must be pointed out here is that the process um, is the um, in a perceived image of regional powers such as China uh, by the Uzbekistan or other uh, geographically smaller countries. As has been stated, anti-Russian sentiments are fueled by the Central Asian's um, you know, past experiences of the Soviet Union and Russian uh, imperialism, while with respect to China, there is a concern about Chinese expansion and eventual domination, not immediate one, but you know, in, in the longer term. Over the last years, uh, you know, plans for several ambitious projects have been articulated, including the creation of common economic space and uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization's bank and energy club. Similar ideas have been put forward by Russia for Eurasia, yet if the principles and goals of these new initiatives do not serve the interests of Central Asian countries, including Uzbekistan, um, it is very likely that you know, they will be perceived as facilitating Chinese and Russian interests and not the ones of Central Asia. In respect to Japan, um, you know, what unites Japan and China in this particular sense is the attempt to see and place themselves in the position of strategic partners for regional states um, such attempts reflect the um, you know, adoption of their foreign policies towards proactive engagement in the international arena and the newly formed uh, you know, externally oriented identities. However the, however, the reasons that these countries exert such efforts are different. For China, the reasons include security concerns, uh, the economic motivations, which are connected primarily to energy resources and tran transportation networks, and these interests have uh, predefined the direction of the Chinese foreign policy in this region. For Japan, the motivations are less clearly defined. Japan, Japan's interest in the joint exploration of and transportation of energy resources appeals to be uh, the only clearly articulated goal of Japanese foreign policy in this region. And we don't actually have any other uh, you know, clearly sort of, um, you know, expressed um, intentions. The um, other incentives for Japanese engagements in the region are explained by the notions of facilitating human development, human security, human rights, international security, but these are very broadly defined, and that actually leads to the inefficiency of the Japanese policy in this region. Now, the last point. You, know, you might think about you know, how all of this is related to the notion of the soft power from the world. According to the NAI, uh, the notion of soft power rests on three resources. Culture, political values, uh, the foreign policies, and the foreign policies, which are um, you know, legitimate um, and um, are seen as moral authority. Now, I also suggest that you know, seduction is always more effective uh, than coercion, and many values like democracy, human rights, and individual opportunities are deeply seductive. According to the NAI, the primary currencies of soft power are an actor's values, culture, and institutions. So when we think about a country like Uzbekistan, and when we think whether it possesses the uh, the, um, you know, the culture, policies, and institutions which might seduce greater powers, uh, you know, I argue that you know, Uzbekistan actually has these elements, but they are very different from what Nye actually interprets. Uh, uh, taking into account these notions, you know, I argue uh, that um, you know, um, to make an inquiry about the applicability of soft power tools by smaller states like Uzbekistan vis-a-vis -vis larger counterparts like China, Russia, and Japan, uh, we can actually say that you know um, that all three components mentioned by Nye can be applied in seducing these three countries. Culture component is used to find a common ground to be understood in relation uh, to China and Japan, that is being Asian, being developing, and doing things in a similar manner. So it's a di it's a different interpretation of, of culture, and Nye himself in his research actually suggests that you know he doesn't claim to have a universal interpretation of culture. So if we change the uh, interpretation of culture, then we can actually say that you know, Uzbekistan actually uses this notion of being Asian and doing things in a, in a different Asian manner uh, when approaching China and Japan. 
While with Russia, Uzbekistan actually uses the Eurasian cultural heritage as a notion which unites uh, interest and always depicts any other country as the other, which is different from the Eurasian uh, identity. In terms of political values, Uzbekistan very skillfully succeeded in framing its political orientation as anti-colonial and anti-imperial, which it often placed against Russia and sometimes against China uh, in order to gain concessions from the West. It can also play the same notion of being anti-imperial and anti-colonial uh, in respect to the United States, as we have seen in 2005 after Antijan events, when uh, you know any calls for democratization have been claim to be neo-colonial. So uh, in this sense, it's not the values of democracy or human rights, but rather Asian values, collective human rights, and anti-colonialism, which unites and you know, serves as the backbone of the Uzbekistan's foreign policy uh, in its application of the notion of soft power. And this in turn leads to a foreign policy of Uzbekistan, which sometimes is described as personalized and unpredictable. It may be so, but nevertheless, Anti-colonial framing plays well for Uzbekistan, and when needed, such anti-colonial stance is played well against uh, Russia, United States, and China uh, in order to gain certain support from those uh, who uh, display sympathy. And the final point, again, I mean, I understand that many of you are uh, more interested about uh, policy implications, and I am more concerned about the theory. So. When I think about uh, you know this nice notion of soft power, I think that you know while Nye uh, claims that his theory does not contradict realism, but rather offers description of another side of power, I argue that it further you know if further developed and properly uh, defined, the notion of soft power can well fit the constructivist rhetoric, and that you know all relationships of Uzbekistan with other countries can be better explained by constructivism, that they are socially constructed in different situations than realism, which is the primary theory, which is now being used uh, to explain uh, foreign policy. That would be the end of my presentation. Thank you.